Okay, I'm going to talk about, we're almost done. I want to talk about, because that's going to be in preparation tomorrow a little bit. I, I want to talk a little bit about why do you put a fuse in a circuit breaker, right? What it does, it's an electrical, a breaker can be an electrical kill switch. It's a way to protect the wire, breaks the connection. We talked earlier about different types of fuses, right? There's fuses that you actually can reset. Those are thermal circuit breakers. All our panels, you know, the little switches that can trip, that's a thermal circuit breaker. Over time, you can just reset it. You don't have to change a fuse. Um, what are the things that you're going to actually always put a fuse at the source of power? That's really important. And make sure the fuse is sized to handle both the wire and the load that is going to be used or the maximum output of a charging circuit. Okay, this is actually, I want to show you just a couple videos, about a couple minutes, not even, 30 seconds each. So this is a video that we did in a long time ago, actually, as a boy then. Fuse location close to the battery. That's where it should be, right? So this effectively is kind of your battery. You got a fuse right there at the beginning of the circuit, and we've got a light right here. What happens when you do a dead short on that circuit? <clears throat> Few sparks. Same, this is the same test. Good, right? So what happened? Right? We have a dead short, right? So this is effectively the battery. Ground path, right? So the current actually, you saw the light went out, right? Because the light has resistance, right? So that's why the current's not going, it's not limitless current going through that light. The light itself, a load, has a resistance, and that's what stops the current from being too much. But as soon as we basically had from this point to this point over another wire, we just put a, a bolt there, that was too much, and it blew the 15 amp fuse, because this is gauge 14 wire. Okay, so that's what a fuse does. Now notice the fuse was at the beginning of the circuit, right? All right, so the next thing we're going to see, I want to see, and this is where, by the way, not to scare you guys, but this is true, 100% of you have this problem on your boat, guaranteed. There's nobody in this room. The, the chances of you not having a fuse badly located on your boat is almost impossible to the point that it's guaranteed that you have fuses. People think that a fuse can be installed anywhere on a circuit. Anywhere. Because they only think that a fuse is there to protect the appliance. Right? Most people, remember, don't like reading. Rule. So they don't read and they don't understand. That's why in your home, your circuit breakers are not somewhere in the house. They're at the beginning of the feed. Right? They're not there for convenience. The convenience is a coincidence. They're there because that's the start of the AC main coming in your home. It's not for convenience. That is just a pure benefit it happens to be. You're not putting the circuit breakers everywhere on the wire and in the bathroom before you plug into an outlet. They're at the beginning of the circuit. They are there to protect the wire and any appliance that connects to that wire. <clears throat> All right. Now let's do, for example, a VHF. VHF comes with a fuse. The fuse is right beside the VHF radio. So now we've got circuit. And you could have your battery, long leads, and then you have a fuse right before the VHF, right? And in this case, it's not a VHF, it's a light. So what happens when you cause a dead short before the fuse? Okay, by the way, this actually, I just want to emphasize, so the only reason it stopped is because the wire melted, because the wire became the fuse, right here. So the camera, nobody's operating the camera, the camera's about this, this high. From, honestly, if it was where the other camera is, at a distance of about 10 feet, the smoke is, by the way, like, you can't see through it. This is not a barbecue, like, uh, s'mores, you're doing marshmallows type of smoke. It was bigger than this screen, completely, absolutely opaque. You could not see through it to save your life. You put your hand in it, there's no way. It was huge. And that is from the shield, the insulation on that jacket, on a wire this long, this long, 
14 gauge, two feet of dead short. That's it, two feet. Imagine what happens when the dead short is on a gauge, an alternator wire, and this is where the stories of people actually can't breathe, passing out, calling May Day in the summer when there's boat fires, and literally they can't, they literally have to, when the, uh, the Coast Guard comes, they have to put them on masks for breathing because of the inhalation from the smoke. They can't open, like this is not a normal fire. This is not a campfire. The jacket, when it melts, it's absolutely terrifying, okay? That's why you don't want smoke on your boat. It's not a fire, like a little fire. Oh, it's so cute. Put a fire extinguisher. You can't see anything. You can't do anything. You can't find it. You are completely, utterly blind. And that's what happens. I speak to tons of boaters that come back and we deal with a lot of insurance claims. Oh, my boat caught on fire. Can you come and rewire it? And I tell you the experience that it happens, and it generally never happens at the dock. They're actually on the water. It's a life event. If they don't get out of boating, it's pretty close. Like it's pretty close. Generally the partner is less inclined to go boating. There's one that it might be, but there's another one that's like, eh, you know what, this was not part of the deal. All right, so this is a demo. We got two last videos and that's it. This video here is, now you got two sizes of wires, two fuses, right? Because every time you change wire size, you gotta change the fuse size. So we had a large fuse at the beginning, small fuse, we changed the wire size, and then we got the light. Again, same test. So the only fuse that blew was this one here because the other fuse over here, the large fuse that we saw earlier, the ANL fuse, was meant to handle the wire gauge of the large cable. That cable is one aught or two aught, I can't remember. So it never blew, right? So this is what happens because you see, this is, this, and why I was bringing this up at the time was I get this all the time. Jeff, I have a fuse on my battery going to my panel. I don't understand why I need fuses on my panel. And you're like, yeah, but the fuse on your battery to the panel is made to handle a wire size. You might have a 100 amp fuse or 50 amp fuse going to your panel. From the panel everywhere else, it's not the same wire size. You're changing the wire size to gauge 14, gauge 16, gauge 10. You're bringing the wire size down. Every time you change the wire size, a fuse is selected for two things. For the load you're going to be running and for the wire size that it's going to be on, right? So now let's look at the last video here. Two, still two sizes of wire, but only a large fuse at the beginning of the circuit. So this is a large fuse. And you'll notice this wire here has no fuse on it at all. Fuse never blew, the big fuse. Doesn't need to, because the amperage of the fuse can handle 150 amps, the wire can only handle 15 amps. So the wire is the fuse in this instance. And again, the only reason it stops is because the wire melted. It was the fuse. So the reason I try to emphasize that is about safety, right? It's about doing things properly, because when you're on a boat, you don't want to have this happen because there's not a lot of exits. Right? It's not like you're on land and you can just go out through a window. Right? There's not, when you're on a boat, you're kind of like on the journey with the boat. Especially here with cold water, you're not going to jump overboard in like 10 degrees Celsius water. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that you make sure that the fuse is made to handle both the load and the wire gauge. And a question earlier was about making sure that it's there to make sure that you don't do nuisance tripping. Right? So that it doesn't trip the fuse too soon. If you're going to swap out a fuse, make sure you disconnect the load, meaning have the battery switch off, because otherwise you're going to get sparks when you connect that, because you're suddenly making a connection. And I have seen that all the time. Boaters are like, oh my god, I'm putting the fuse on, it's, it's actually sparking. Well, it's because you have a load on. Make sure your loads are disconnected before, because you're connect, completing the circuit by putting the fuse on. Really important, make sure you put a protective positive post, like covering, on top of fuses. Some of them, it's all exposed, it's all metal. You don't want to have an accident, accidental short. And then the other thing too is the, 
always carry spare fuses. Some fuses are easy to find in the middle of nowhere, some aren't. So, you know, as, as boaters, we should have a list of all the fuses we have. I know all this takes time, but if you want to be on your own or self-sufficient, it helps, especially as you go more north. If you're sailing in Howe Sound or English Bay, and that's all you're doing, all this, I mean, having spare fuses, sure. But if you're going to the Browns, or you're going to Discovery, or outside of Vancouver Island, spare fuses is kind of a must. And then when you're choosing a thermal breaker, you know, like windlasses are going to say, I want an 80 amp thermal breaker. Well, do an 80 amp, right? And some of them, what's nice is they come with a switch, right? They actually, the thermal breaker allows you to turn it on and off, which is what a circuit breaker is on our panels, right? It's not only a thermal circuit breaker, it's actually an on off. You use that to turn the circuit on or off. Also remember that <clears throat> thermal circuit breakers are generally used on loads that can be accidentally or that will commonly trip. And loads that will commonly trip without a short are motorized loads. And we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. When the voltage drops on something, remember power equals VI. If the voltage drops, you're running your windlass. You don't have your alternator running. You're running it a lot. So the batteries were partially empty. As the voltage goes down to 10 or 11, 10.5, 10, 9.5, the amperage will have to do the exact same proportional up reaction because it's two things. The power of the windlass will never draw more or less than 1200 watts. Regardless of the voltage fed to it, the amperage will just keep increasing to offset the voltage drop. And that's why windlasses are always recommended with a thermal circuit breaker because it can happen that your windlass breaker will pop, not because you have a short, it's because it was under low voltage and the amperage exceeded what the windlass should be having. Does that make sense, everyone? That's really good. And that's why thermal circuit breakers definitely have their applications for loads that can often trip. And those are generally motorized loads. Question? So you also have made sense. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, if you've got a, a big light bulb and the, and, the, and the voltage drops, the current drops too because you've got a constant resistance. So how is the motor different from that? No, it's going to stay the same. Absolutely. If it's a 1200 watt load, V equals VI. P equals VI. V is going to drop, current is going to go up. And that's why, that was why those circuit breakers are absolutely there. You can also calculate the current from the resistance. Yeah, the V equals IR. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't work like that. Okay. It doesn't. I know. I get that all the time. P equals VI. And this is the danger. And this is why starters die, thrusters die. They don't die because they're badly manufactured. It's because they're working under low voltage and the current going through them is going higher than it used to be to make sure that the load is still at 1200. Yeah. So this is now a recap of what we talked about today, right? We basically went through all of that. The big takeaway I think is really important, especially as you're adding, is modularity is a really big thing, right? Thinking about the different ways, the combiner, the isolator, that you're going to share power from an alternator or batteries to battery. And then looking at the different ways that you can go about charging your batteries, right? Being a charger, an alternator, solar controller, it could be a wind turbine, it could be a DC gen. All of those are different ways for you to create energy or power to be stored in a battery. <clears throat> And then on the load side, you can see there's a lot of different things. I didn't talk about that, but one last point. If you're wondering why I have a fuse block on the unswitched side and a fuse block on the switch side, you're going to have unswitched circuits that are to code. What would that be? Propane detector. What's another one? Bilge pump. Bilge pump. Another one? Anyone else? Stereo memory. There's certain circuits that should be left all the time. Few, bilge pump is probably the best example. You should be able to walk away from a boat, turn your battery switch off, and your bilge pump should work. So you can isolate all loads on your boat, except a few, bilge pump being probably number one on the list. And that is called the unswitched distribution fuse block. And those are very few loads, right? You might have VHF radio might be another one. Yes? Can you just run through the different types of fuses, like a T fuse? Class T, A and L. I'm going to do a little bit more on fusing tomorrow because there's some troubleshooting. 
Yeah, so there's ATO, ATC, Glassfuse, ANL, Mega, uh, Class T, there's uh, MRBF. It's a little bit like everything's built for a purpose, right? The world we live in is not simple anymore. You can get a sense, right? I mean, we just did, what, six hours, and I'm only scratching the surface. Every field is nonstop and everything. Fusing is another one. It's like, is a tire a tire? No, actually, it isn't. You're like, oh, what tire are you using it for? What application? So you have different fuses for different applications. What's interesting about a class T versus an ANL, which are two big fuses, is the rate at which they trip. The reason why class Cs are used for inverters, or suggested by a lot of inverter manufacturers, is because they have a faster trip time, meaning they will not have a higher tolerance. Like you could have a fuse, for example, an ANL fuse, and you're like, 300 amps, it will let 1,000 amps go through it. You're like, what? I th thought you said it was a 300 amp. Well, it's 300 amp for continuous over two seconds, as long as you don't peak so much. Like they'll leave these high inrush for these inductive, these motorized loads when they come on, like a starter. A starter, you might on a compound meter see only 300 amps, but for a microsecond, it went to 1200. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, yeah, it's a 300 continuous, but for a very short period of time, and that trip time is at one of the specification of a fuse. A class T fuse is gonna have a very shorter trip time. It doesn't want the inverter, because an inverter will never s stop to do what you ask of it. I always think about my lab that passed away. I could make her fetch for, until she dies. She would do it until she dies. And an inverter's the same way. It doesn't say, oh, I'm 2000 watt. I can't do more. No, it's gonna try. You could put 4,000 watt load on a 2,000 watt inverter. The only thing that stops it from doing 4,000 watts is that you put in a fuse that will trip after you draw more than 2,000 watt of power. And that's why it's essential to have on an inverter, and most people don't have a fuse on an inverter, believe it or not, to have a fuse so that when you overload the inverter, the inverter actually, the fuse trips. And that's what's actually protecting the inverter from actually doing more work than it should. That's why class T is the really common one. And there's some fuses too that are ignition protected and some that aren't, right? And especially for some of us that have gasoline boats, that's a big concern because where are you gonna put, like a class T fuse is not ignition protected but an AL and one is. So on boats that have, for example, an inverter, not in the engine room, we'll put an ignition protected fuse at the beginning of the circuit in the engine room, go through bulkheads, they're completely sealed, go completely nuts, and then put the class T fuse beside the inverter to protect the inverter, and the NAL fuse is gonna be protecting the wire. You had a question? No, nope, you covered it. No, oh. failed it. All right, other questions on anything that we talked about? There you go. Uh, can you just uh, quickly discuss a battery capacity test? Oh, yes, battery capacity test. Okay, all right, let's go down the wormhole. Battery capacity. So battery capacity is sort of your ability to take alcohol. It's a function of time. I could probably take a drink every two hours and probably never be drunk, you know? Got a lot of experience, I'm good. But if I take five drinks in five minutes, gonna be a problem, right? So your ability to process alcohol is a function of time. Your batteries, are actually the same. Everything is a factor of the discharge rate, the rate at which you discharge a battery. When everyone here in the room thinks about a battery and they say, oh, I have a 100 amp hour battery, what they're saying, code, is at a C20 rating, my battery is 100 amp hours. Meaning, if I discharge my batteries over a 20 hour discharge period, right, and my battery, also more complicated, is at a certain temperature, so you should actually have your battery temperature compensated. I could discharge that battery, a 100 amp hour battery bank, over 20 hours would be five amps. So you literally go five amps, and you take that, and that battery, if you discharge it at five amps, will bring you down after 20 hours to 100 amp hours. That's why when we do battery testing, it's time consuming because there's no such thing as a quick and easy way to predict how a battery will do under deep cycle discharge than to actually do a deep cycle sort of marathon. So what we'll do is we'll actually find out what the C5 rating is, what is capacity over a five hour discharge, and we'll discharge that battery over five hours. Use that and translate that to what the battery capacity would be at 20 hours. 
So certain batteries, you'll see them and they're deceiving. They'll tell you telecom batteries are going to say, oh yeah, my battery is 100 amp hours, but what they're failing to tell you is it's a C8 rating or it's a different type of rating. So you always have to think about C20 is what it is, capacity over a 20 hour discharge. And so if you want to know what your battery is, or you bought a boat and you don't know what your battery bank is, you say, okay, what's my battery bank? Let's say four golf cart batteries. Four golf cart batteries wiring 12 volts, 440 amp hours. No problem. Start the test, and you give me four numbers. You're my data logger. Generally, I delegate this to boat owners because it takes time. You give me time, volts, amps, amp hours. Should have an amp hour meter, right? If you don't, it makes it hard. Remember, I love amp hour meters. Another reason. Every hour on the hour, you start telling me what was the volts. The amps should stay the same, should be always five, about, right? And then you should tell me what the time is, because I want to know that you actually took it at that time. If you didn't, I don't want to assume. And you tell me what the amp hour is. Amp hour shouldn't be, shouldn't, should be an increment. I don't want any surprises. After one hour, it's five. After two hours, it's 10. I want you to prove to me that there was no, um, like a fridge would not be a good load to put on, because a fridge is an intermittent load. It comes on and goes. You need a steady load, like a light bulb, something like that. And you do that, and uh, you'll basically find out what it is after a period of time. And then that value, you can say, okay, well, I did the test and I'm at 95% of what I thought I would, or I'm at 70% or 30%. And that is the only way of actually knowing what a, the battery, true battery capacity is, is by doing a C20 test or C5, but you need time. And you recommend it every year? No. No, because doing so takes away 2% of a battery bank capacity on a typical conventional battery. Conventional battery is about 350 cycles at full discharge. You can, it's dangerous to geek out too much. Meaning, when I had my flooded lead acid batteries, I switched to Firefly, but when I had my flooded lead acid batteries, what did I do? I wired them for even discharge. I made sure they had the right charge rate, and I made sure that I always topped them off with distilled water. My eight golf cart batteries lasted me, it's not a joke, 11 years. It's off the charts. It's like saying I live to 120. If you live to 120, you're doing something good. Like good genetics or whatever, but there's no such thing in batteries. I wasn't lucky, is I love them. But I didn't go further, right? I still discharge them to theoretical 50. They probably lasted longer, but I mean, at one point I'm telling myself, 11 years out of a battery bank, you did me well. Thank you very much for your service. And then I'm like, I'm moving on to a different battery bank. Right, so it's about finding a balance between monitoring and calculating constantly what is the new battery bank capacity, re-entering that in the battery monitor and saying, you know what, let's just take an average. Now, when I did my battery monitor and my battery said they were 880, did you think I entered a marketing number that was probably happened once in the lab and the guy was like, sales guy was like, really? Don't you think we could just increase it just a little bit? Are they ever gonna know? No, it's fine. Like, I don't do that. I'm like, 880 amp hours, 800 amp hours. Like, let's take some skin off, you know what I mean? Like, I know that reality is never what is promised. So I pull back the numbers and I use that on my battery bank capacity on my monitor and it lasted literally me 11 years until I switched to Firefly. So I think it's always about finding a common balance between what's reasonable and what's too onerous as an owner to do. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so good question. I'm starting my engine with a deep cycle battery. Am I hurting my engine by doing so? No, I'm hurting my battery. Batteries. Am I hurting something? We'll phrase it like that. Engine's starting just fine. Yeah. You're, in this situation, you're lucky because you only have an eight horse yeah. engine. Very small need for a lot of power suddenly to move that. You could hand crank that engine. The challenge with bigger engines when you start them with deep cycle is that your starter wants a lot of oomph right there and then in a moment. And because the voltage drops, the amperage increases on a starter. 
And if the amperage drop, the voltage drops a lot to nine volts, eight volts, because the deep cycle battery is completely built differently. And I was entertaining putting slides of what a deep cycle battery looks like. I was like, oh God, this is geeking out too much. Like I find it interesting, but like Jeff, you're pushing it. They are completely built differently. So I would encourage, and you're, you, I think you're the exception to the rule, right? Your engine is, you're lucky. It's, it doesn't need a lot of cranking amps. But that I don't think reflects to everyone else. I think that when you're buying a battery for your boat and if you're going to use it as an engine battery, I strongly suggest, by the way, an engine battery is probably two-thirds or half the price of a deep cycle battery. So if you're going to, you're going to actually save money to buy a starter battery for a starter application than buying a deep cycle battery for a starter application. So financially, it makes more sense to go with a starter battery because it costs less and it's better. But you can't do the opposite for a deep cycle application. Deep cycle application, you need to spend more money and buy the deep cycle battery. Go ahead. What about then when I start my uh, motor, I always start it on, on all battery so that I can charge up my starter and when I'm going along starting up my, uh, storing up my house because I don't want to be switching the switcher because yeah. of what we talked about before. Oh, I. God, I love this. I love this. All right, question. I start my engine on all, right? A source selector battery switch that has off one, two, both, uh, because I want both of my batteries to be charged when I'm running my engine. Great question. I strongly disagree with that. Why? I think that before you leave the home, your birth, you want to know that your engine battery can start your engine on its own. It's sort of for me like leaving the house and start leaving the house with a cane. You know what? You, before you go on a trek in the woods, you don't want to start, you don't want to have your backup used as your primary. I think it's very important to use the primary as the primary and to always start at the dock. No, before you leave your berth, that your engine battery isn't sufficient to recharge to start your engine, because that's when you have control. Once you're out on the water, you don't have control. You could have gone just for a day sail, and your batteries are completely full, your charger was on, and then four or five hours later, the all is not enough. And what's the backup to all? There is no backup. All is all. It's all, everything you got. So all, to me, is, is an emergency thing. And I always emphasize to all the boaters that I deal with, if you have to start your boat on all, I want to call. If you can't call me, call someone else. But know that you're going out, and now you're saying that your engine battery is not enough to start your engine. So if you, your concern would be to put a battery combiner, solve that problem, change the battery switch, because you can, it's a make before break. You can go from one to all or both, and two, no problem, a million times. If you have a normal switch, no problem. The switch is made to do that. You just can't go from one to off to two to both. You do all the connections on top. You just don't go on the off stage to go back. And that's why the switch is called make before break. And the switch is built for that. If it's not an old switch, 30, 40 years old, it's gonna do it no problem. That would be my, it's, it's a personal opinion. That's all it is. No right or wrong, personal opinion. So you could start on battery one and then? After five minutes, let's say. You can do, yeah, there's two ways of doing this, right? You could do, some owners will start on battery one, wait five minutes, and not even bother about all. They're like, screw it. Because I might forget to take it on all later on when I get to my destination, right? Because some destinations can be pretty distracting. It's not like we get to our destination like, oh God, I'm here. This is so boring. What am I going to do with my time? I wish that my life was not going so bad. It's like you get to destination and you're like, oh my God, this is the best thing on earth. The last thing you're thinking about is like, oh, let me go change my dial switches and while everyone else is inviting you to do whatever is maybe pleasurable in your life, right? So I recommend that what owners is you start on one, run it five minutes, right? And then after five minutes, go to two and then recharge your house and never even bother with all. Because once your batteries start, five minutes is plenty to recharge your engine battery. The problem is doing it at your destination is there is no room for error, right? 
no room. Like if you forget the all and you discharge your batteries after two days in Anchorage, there is no, oh, I've got this. You're like, no, there is no, I got nothing. The backup was with the primary. Now you're to one battery bank. Now what? Now it's, I don't know, call someone, float over, tender, do you have a battery? Can I lend a battery? Can you come over? I need a battery. Do you want to take your battery out of your boat? I need a new battery. I need, like, it's, it's, it's a headache, if right? your switch, though, is 30 or 40 years old, it would be probably beneficial to replace it. So that Correct. isn't some That's, kind of zone in it that would... I had that conversation earlier. Don't expect things to last forever. Change the switch or put a combiner in. Never switch again. Other, yes, go ahead. Um, a few years back, I accidentally discharged my battery down to about uh, 10. Yeah, which is dead. Yeah. And so my first thought was, okay, I should put the charger on in the middle of summer. And so I did, and it kind of went click, click, click a few times, and I thought, things are pretty quiet. And I thought, oh, there's no power. So I, so, so I put in the charger again, and I realized, oh, the charger is dead. So it basically committed suicide by trying to charge a heavily dis discharged battery. Is there some way to, how do you charge your batteries if you accidentally you discharge them? Yeah, so the question is, what happens when you seriously discharge your battery? Which, by the way, is going to happen to all of us, right? I mean, it's pretty common. You can feel bad about it, rightly so, but it's going to happen to all of us. Your batteries are completely discharged. And now you try to recharge them. What happens is most battery chargers will actually not charge a dead battery. You're like, what? Isn't that your job? Your job is to recharge a battery. You're called a battery charger. Well, no, again, nothing is easy. The battery charger is only going to charge a battery that doesn't perceive as dead because if it's dead, it actually could catch fire. So they'll only battery chargers in a battery shop where they're kind of like, it's not really a battery, they're forcing it. So I've had boaters that have actually literally take their batteries off the boat, bring them to a battery shop that has a charger that doesn't care, to bring them back to life, charge enough, like 10, 11 volts, take the batteries, put them back in the boat, and the other normal charger will say, oh, it's just a low battery. But some chargers will say, the battery voltage is too low, I ain't charging you. Even though you're a charger, they're like, no, I know I'm a charger, but I'm not a charger on a dead battery. So... That happens all the time. In the summer, my God, every day. Every day I get that call. Every day I get that call. Yeah. Other questions? I'm willing to, after the course is done, letting everyone go, I want to thank you for being here today. A big thank you. And everyone at home, thanks for watching. And if you've got any further questions, welcome to either drop online, write a comment, or come and see me right here. And I'm here to answer any question you might have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.